Hello, uh, my name is Dr. Talha. I am a trust care doctor working in Nottingham University Hospital. For those who have been joining this lecture series, we are delivering a lecture every day on Thursday at 6 p.m. Uh, we're targeting the MRCS Part A in September for people who want to do it. Today, it gives me an immense pleasure to introduce someone uh, as a consultant. He's a plastic consultant in a plastic surgeon in Winston Hospital, Liverpool. And I would double thank him because of the reason, because there's a bank holiday in UK and he has given his time. So I am I'm, I'm greatly, I'm really happy to hear the lecture. So uh, uh, Hi, everybody. And thank you very much, Talha, for inviting me for this uh, uh, course. Uh, uh, teaching is always my passion and I always enjoy it. And uh, uh, today, I think we are basically talking about the MRCS part B. Uh, so how many candidates have we got? I wonder whether we can make it more interactive depending on the number or it's just the... So we'll, we'll be having 15, 20 people minimum. Okay, okay. The people That's are good. joining in. So if anybody wants to ask any question. Uh, so basically, I think the scope of today's talk is to give you an overview uh, of what the MRC is about. And basically, how to approach any exam in general, but in particular MRCS. As you know that... Uh, I can keep on admitting or you can keep on admitting as well. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to, yeah. Okay, that's fine. So as you know, this is the, uh, this is the membership for Royal College of Surgeons exam, uh, which gives you some sort of basic uh, level, uh, which you must attain before you are enrolled into any surgical uh, training program. Uh, and for that reason, there are two parts. Uh, you already should have completed your theory part or MCQ part, which will underpin your all application of the knowledge for the part B, i.e. you should have a background of uh, basic science, sciences knowledge like anatomy, physiology, pathology. In addition to that, you will have some sort of uh, general clinical uh, experience and knowledge. And this part is actually all about testing not only your clinical side, but also uh, your professionalism, that how you approach, how you see. And important part of that is the how you approach a problem, like uh, something we, as an examiner, I have an examiner for different exams, including MRCS and RCS plastic surgery. So there's something called higher order thinking, which means the examiner is looking at that, how will you behave as a doctor? How will you handle this particular situation? And what is the process of thinking? So for, just to give you an example that you may be given a very small task, for example, one station may be just a suturing station, okay? But even that uh, station involves at least 15 to 20 different observations. It's actually as challenging for the examiner as for the candidate. So within that uh, space, we are actually looking for how you behave as a doctor, as a person, how you approach a patient, how you communicate. One thing which is the biggest challenge of this exam is actually the time, because it's a very uh, extensive exam uh, which you have to condense in a very short stations. Every station is roughly nine minutes, and that does not include your reading time. So one minute is reading time, and nine minutes for the thing. And within that, you will be asked a few questions. Uh, so you have to have enough time that you're carrying over your task, simultaneously prepared for some sort of uh, questions, which are normally related to, if there's a procedure related to the physiology behind any, uh, any why you're choosing this particular procedure, then the post-operative instruction and, uh, uh, and if patients are asking any questions. So you have to keep going, keep thinking, at the same time behaving in the professional way, i.e. Uh, the approach which is safe, uh, both from a uh, health and safety point of view, like uh, minimizing the risk of uh, injury to yourself, to your staff, to the patient, identifying the patient, communicating with the patient, and at the same time, carrying out your task and keep smiling as well. So don't come across as too nervous, too unconfident because you have to infuse confidence in your, in your patient or, or in your or, uh, uh, actor or dummy, whichever is there. So it's a test of many aspects of you as a doctor. And as the key is that uh, preparation and practice and practice. It becomes a second nature. Like if I tell you uh, a lecture on how to ride a bicycle, it, it will sound almost impossible, yeah? But once you start riding it, it becomes your second nature and you'll go with it. So the more you practice, the better you become. So with that, if you're failing to prepare, you are preparing to fail and time is the essence. 
So be mindful of your time for each station. If you could take even one this message, that is the main thing. So prepare your full task for eight minutes. So still got one minute to, to reflect or, or, or something else. So prepare your task for a shorter time than is the actual time because you will take more time. Just to give it an idea, uh, part B has got a very broad format, 18 stations. So which are looking into different aspects of applied knowledge and applied skill, exactly testing your all sort of things. So from one aspect to the other, you're jumping, one minute you're taking consent, other minute you're giving ethical scenario, third minute there's a critical uh, care situation, fourth minute you are dealing with an angry patient who hasn't uh, uh, been uh, very happy with the overall care and is very aggressive. And your job is to calm him down within that thing. Fifth minute, uh, uh, certain post-op complications is coming up and your bleep is going off. And sixth minute, you are dealing with an absent colleague who can't, and you are just finished your long shift and you have, to, you have been asked to continue your rota. So you can see the scope of your, and that is actually not hypothetical, that actually happens in your daily life as a doctor. So we are testing all these things as you're going along. So broadly, there are two broad categories, applied knowledge and applied skills. And roughly, as I said, the nine minutes for each, one minute is reading time. And the maximum mark for each station is 20 marks. Uh, and and uh, for different domains, usually including your overall impression, professionalism, knowledge, and uh, how you answer the questions. Yeah. So this is the applied knowledge base, the eight stations three primarily to the anatomy. Some may be purely fact-based. For example, they may show you a cross-section of the pelvis showing, okay, what is this? Where, what is the relationship of uh, uh, was deference to ureter or, 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 uh, or the ureter uh, to fallopian tube if you're doing hysterectomy? Uh, what are the different fascia? You may, you may be shown uh, a part of the chest showing the, what is this thing, pericardium, pericondrium. Uh, periosteum, uh, this is uh, how far does the pleurag go? If you have a stab injury to this, what structures can you damage? This is the wrist injury, where is the median nerve? So these are quick hard facts, but some aspects of applied as well at the same time. Then there could be surgical pathology. For example, you may be shown a tumor, you may be shown a mass. What do you think? What does it look like? Uh, and you may have to sort of educated uh, guess what is the location of that mass, but is the Characteristic of that, for example, is a common sense. If the mass has got uh, smooth edges, uh, well demarcated, not penetrating the surrounding tissue, you can say it looks like a expansile growth, which is in keeping with the benign nature of a mass, as opposed to the infiltrative with the hemorrhage, which, uh, with the necrotic tissue, uh, uh, which means it's rapidly growing, most likely malignant. Uh, so that is, that is the applied part of that sort of uh, anatomy uh, and then the pathology, or you may be shown uh, certain aspects of uh, other straightforward pathology, like is this a, uh, is a thickened gallstone and the gallbladder, what could be the causes for this? Applied surgical, as the name applies, is applying your knowledge to a surgical situation, which will also be relevant to the anatomy as well as to that particular situation. For example, uh, uh, if you got a stab injury to the right hypochondrium, what do you think? What structures can be damaged? Uh, a patient post-operatively going into shock, low, high, low blood pressure, uh, you have been called by nurse, what will you do? You know, patient just had an operation, what could be the causes for that? Critical situation, uh, multi, multiple injuries, abdominal trauma, pelvic trauma, blood loss, which can be complicated with uh, other conditions, such as patient could be diabetic or with a pre-existing ischemic heart disease, because these conditions can coexist. So if you are ruling out the obvious causes, still is not compatible with your clinical picture, then can you think outside your box? And that's where the higher order thinking comes in. And that's where they are judging you that how safe you are as a doctor. And can you just think outside the box, yeah? You may be given a written data interpretation. For example, if somebody is going into shock, the lactate levels are going high, or somebody into respiratory compromise, 
uh, breathing rate is low and uh, retaining carbon monoxide or ca sorry carbon dioxide or hypoxia so it's a type 1 type 2 failure uh, why is type 1 uh, uh, why is type 2 more serious than type 1 and that sort of thing or you may be shown uh, uh, some numbers for uh, AKI acute kidney injury uh, or maybe shown some sort of visual information like a patient is gasping struggling for breathing uh, tracheal tug and things was going on, respiratory uh, obstruction, upper respiratory, low respiratory, that sort of situation. Yeah. So as long as you know, it doesn't matter how many number of patients they are, as long as you've got a generic format, generic scheme in your head, it doesn't matter, they can, they can change the format of the exam, they can do many things. If you are approaching logically, you will be fine. It is an easy exam, easy to pass, as long as you know, honestly, it's very easy to pass. As long as you know how to manage your time, don't waste your time on sort of aspects of the history which is irrelevant. Try to finish taking your history and presentation within two or three minutes, full stop. Similarly, if you're examining and if you think some question, normally you're not supposed to ask questions, but if you're examining somebody, it's okay to ask a very relevant obvious question if you're not sure, but keep on examining at the same time. It's okay to ask, you behave like a, like a normal person, like a doctor. Don't do what you would normally not do in your day-to-day -day practice, yeah? In the applied skills, here, which is really a, a problem with the time. I've seen people struggling here, running out of time. A good candidate will easily finish the task in given time and maybe have actually one minute left. A struggling candidate will not finish the task, will that, and, and that way probably you made some of the last few steps which carry equally important uh, aspects of the exam and the marks. For example, if you are asked for suturing something, yeah? So the best use of your uh, time is that, okay, you will say that, okay, so while you're scrubbing your hands, you quickly tell the patient, I have been asked, I'll kind of check your identity, this is who am I, this is who you are, or at least give the impression that looking at the exam, I assume that the patient's name date has been checked and patient has been consented. If not, I'll check this thing. 30 seconds, done. And then you approach to the patient, just tell them, look, uh, sometimes they will tell you that you've got an assistant. Make uh, examiner known what you're thinking. And it's okay to think aloud. Okay, so yes, I'm hoping to use this as a close this wound with interrupted non-absorbable sutures. So, okay, what local have you got? Uh, Lignocan, they may ask you a dose of the uh, because they may test your pharmacological knowledge. So what dose will you use, okay? And you need to know, say if it's a, uh, without adrenaline, is uh, is a four, three to four milligram, with adrenaline, seven milligram uh, per kg. So people struggle here that how many milligrams in one ml? So percentage solution is the gram in 100 ml. So if you got one gram in 100 ml or thousand milligram in 100 ml, that is 1%, which means one ml will have 10 milligram. If it's 2% lignocaine, one, millig one ml will have 20 milligram. So if you are using the withdrawalines, it's seven, seven uh, milligram per mil, yeah? Uh, per kg is the dose, so it's a 70 kg, kg. So seven times uh, 70, so 490, roughly 500. So you can tell that one is uh, 20, so you can give roughly uh, 20 times 20 is 4, so 20 to 25 ml is the safe dose. So they will know straight away. They'll ask you which, which solution, which local, how much, how will you inject? You'll tell I need a, a fine uh, needle, like orange, orange gauge is fine, which is uh, 21. Uh, so you need to show this. Uh, so, okay, so just, to, just coming back to the station that, okay, I want to use interruptive sutures. You select your instruments for skin, always to always do uh, uh, forceps, okay? Uh, use your needle holder, scissors, make up your tray before you start, so you're not struggling during the surgery yeah? or during the stitching. Uh, skin prep, uh, keep the, so get all your things ready in a sterile way in a tube as you would do in the normal setting. And then if you have to prep and change your glove, but make sure the sterility of the selection to transfer of the instruments into tray until the patient is not compromised. And the patient is informed. And then at the end, you'll give post-op instruction. The stitches will be taken out in seven to 10 days time. 
and you have to dispose of shocks. So people struggle. So there are quite a few steps. They say, oh, there was simple stitching. And try to do simple stitches. You may be master of subcutical stitches, but the foam is quite rigid. It's usually is a foam model. So what we found with the practice that the simple thing is that use uh, simple interpret sutures uh, and uh, three, uh, two knots, three knots, four knots, whatever you're comfortable. So do one thing. So that gives you sort of flavor that nine minutes will pass very quickly, but you have to communicate with the patient, with your assistant, select the instruments, move them safely in a sterile way to the patient, get a sterile field, remain uh, throughout aseptic uh, technique, maintain aseptic technique, dispose of all the shops at the end, and then say thank you and, and make you, uh, you say that, okay, we write everything, operation note, yeah? So in the, so that, that's a procedural skill. Then we may be given some clinical scenarios, which include physical examination, commonly some sort of swelling, neck lump, thyroid, uh, abdominal examination. They may check some of the generic skills. Uh, uh, for example, tying a knot in the depth uh, around a hook. So that's the magnetic hook. So if you lift it up, that means you in real life, you may worse the vessel. So try doing multiple knots in different depths. Uh, similarly, vein puncture, uh, uh, draining an abscess. Again, you may be asked that what local will you use, dose, prepping, what skin prep will you use, how will you dispose of, uh, and all. If you're using the skin prep, you'll ask, are you allergic to iodine, not to a hexidine, or, or similarly, but common sense questions, yeah? Communication skills, history taking. Very common, but I think that your history have to be concise, and you have to be mindful what you're asking, and the language you are using, not big jargon words and uh, what information you're getting and what is the relevance of that, okay? Uh, you can keep going on and on and on and take very long history, which is totally irrelevant. So for example, uh, a swelling, the common thing is that, okay, onset, progression, uh, duration, any symptoms, infection, discharge, any other similar swelling, yeah? Four or five major salient features. And also, where it is, how long do you have, do you know how did it develop? Is it progressing, getting better, healing? Generic condition of the patient, whether the patient is uh, uh, in good nutritional status, positive, negative, anabolic state, uh, and these sort of things. Uh, information exchange uh, in the communication skill, they, that will check A, how you communicate with the patient, for example, consent, which again, you comes your judgment of a mentor, uh, capacity such the patient is able to understand, retain, uh, and make an informed decision about the procedure. You can explain all the risk. You may be asked to, to, to share this information with your consultant. For example, you have got a call, somebody with uh, an ANE, you have been uh, asked that uh, you are approaching a patient uh, who has been brought to AND with abdominal trauma, losing blood. You know, this is a complex situation. You know, you will need your uh, consultants will quickly go assess and then come back and inform your uh, consultant on the other end of the phone. So whatever you see, you have to draw a picture in your words. So it's very crystal clear to your consultant what is going on. And not only just simply giving the facts, but also you have to give your thoughts as well. What do you think is going on and what you would do and what you've already done. So for example, you say that the patient is uh, presenting with the hypotension, with a severe abdominal pain, radiating to the back. He's otherwise fit and, uh, or fit and well or middle age, previously known with some sort of swelling, pulsatile swelling in the abdomen. And okay, you're concerned to say, what do you think? I think it could be a leaking aneurysm. Okay, so I have skewered the IV line. I've sent some bloods. I've informed the theater already, or at least I'm going to inform the theater that the patient may be coming. So this is a life-saving emergency, yeah? So that shows that you are thinking ahead. You've got a plan. And then, okay, I've sent all the bloods, I've informed the anesthetists, I've done this, this, this. But I'm also, uh, uh, I think there will be enough time to have a quick ultrasound if I can get the ultrasound to see what is going on. Is there another pathology, for example, it, the, although there's a past history of aortic aneurysm, but the patient has also got known diabetic disease or peptic ulcer. Just want to make sure there's no free gas under the diaphragm. Or is there actually the aortic aneurysm, which is, because he was stable on his last visit. 
So which shows that, okay, yeah, you are not actually uh, going into tunnel vision, that you know one diagnosis, that you close your mind that, yeah, this is it, nothing else can happen. Rather, you are actually open that, yeah. Uh, and then you're also trying to organize uh, the management at the same time. Uh, and that shows that how, and uh, you can communicate, okay, I'll wait for your thing, but in the meantime, I'll inform the theater, uh, ITU has been informed, and, and you come. So, uh, so sound like you are having a mutual conversation, like as you would be managing the patient if no help is available, yeah? And the last one is like a, an organization or management uh, sort of thing. For example, you're given uh, a task that, okay, your rota, you have got three things to cover, but you've got only two people available, how will you juggle? Can you overlap few things? Can you assign two tasks like doing a ward round and then uh, joining in the busy clinic, but doing some of the non-urgent ward tasks later uh, or asking the, the nurses to make a list and we'll join them later. Or uh, you've been asked to approach by the theater that these are the three things on your list. Uh, how will you prioritize? You've got a diabetic uh, abscess. You've got a strangulated hernia, for example. And uh, you've got a trauma patient who's struggling to breathe. Uh, you got uh, acute abdomen. So prioritize. This is your list and uh, which order will you want to do? And you have to have a rational. You can pick and choose. Okay, this looks like a top priority. This is the bottom, but these two in the middle are gray zone. Which can go second, which can go third. And you have to rationalize. And that's your applied knowledge and the skills. That doesn't make any sense. So because sorry, I can't have any visual feedback, but but for example, many people think that diabetic always have to be first on the list. That's fine, diabetic abscess, yes, take priority. But what is the strangulated hernia? Because if it's a significant strangulated hernia with abdominal pain and patient is becoming toxic, the life, the simple thing is the life is before anything else. So life-saving procedures first, then the limb saving. So for example, if you've got an ischemic, uh, critical ischemia of a leg, you need embolectomy. Uh, and you got a, a strangulated hernia, and you got a diabetic abscess. And, and they'll give you these sort of scenarios just to check you. And it can happen in real life, so okay. So yes, obviously, because the strangulated hernia can cause uh, peritonitis, can kill the patient, probably you'll do that one first. Ischemia, ischemic limb, uh, ischemia time, peripheral limb can take muscle ischemia four to five hours, okay, so. If it's a just a recent onset, if not, then whether you can do simultaneous theater, but otherwise you have to do that. Uh, diabetic abscess, which is on periphery, otherwise patient fit, yeah, you can do next. Or if everything else is cold, then the diabetic abscess comes at the top. So you have some sort of prioritizing system in your head. Yeah. So that's what exactly what I meant, that uh, higher order thinking is what they're looking for these days, whether it is a, top end exam, whether it's the consultant exam, whether it's the unit exam. This is a sort of algorithm you should be applying. That uh, get the facts, weigh them, triage them, uh, and then, then see where do you sit and quickly can you prioritize with certain basic sort of rules and then take an action at the same time, analyze and evaluate. For example, I've just given you some examples already. The, I mean, if the patient has uh, a ruptured aortic aneurysm, yeah, and the patient presents and you have been asked to see, I've already given you some idea that, okay, you will rule out any other cause, you will quickly uh, assess the patient, mobilize all your channels and, and involve theater, involve uh, uh, sonographers, involve anesthetists, involve ITU. Uh, road track accidents is another thing, multi-trauma, in which the abdominal trauma usually takes a priority. But, but giving an example, for example, you've got a patient post-op uh, going into hypotension. Uh, how many candidates have you got? 15 plus candidates are here. So if I can see some images, so if I don't mind, Jamal, could you unmute yourself, Jamal Khan? Okay, so for yeah, example, yes, very sir. quickly, you got uh, three Sorry, minutes, sir, right? actually. Actually, yeah, I'm outside. There is a lot of uh, don't noise. Worry. Don't so, worry. Okay, Dr. Yeah. Dr. Ahmed Naim, would you mind uh, if you are in a better environment? Mm -hmm. 
Hello. I think, sir, they're all doing something and listening to the lecture somehow. Okay, okay, that's fine. Anyway, so just to give you an idea, okay, the typical thing is the post-operative hypertension, okay? The common things come common that I, is it due to bleeding? But okay, you have given some fluid, you've done everything. Uh, uh, for example, if somebody's got a TURP, okay, so which is transurethral uh, bladder or, or tumor, or bladder tumor or prostate resection, okay? Patient is going oliguric or nothing is coming in the catheter. Now they are, the nurse ask you, okay, what is going on? Okay, so you approach to the patient. One way is that, okay, you may think oh, the patient is uh, hypertensive due to anesthesia, due to hypovolemia, due to loss of blood, due to whatever. But immediately approaches can be in a different way. You can actually go and check for the vital signs. Is the blood pressure high enough? Yeah. Is the patient tachycardic? Probably a little bit if it's not pain control. But if the major parameters are fine, that means there's less likely to be a pre renal cause, i.e., hypertension. It could be simple catheter blocked. Okay. So you, you feel for the bladder is very full. These days, you can go to the ultrasound if there's available, or you percuss, it feels very full, nothing is coming out. Is a TURP, common thing is clot uh, blocking the catheter. You try to wash it out. With the blood change, try to suck it out, it starts working, job done. Okay, catheter is free, still no urine. That means that now you have to think of some other causes. So is the patient hypertensive, tachycardic, hypovolemic, low blood pressure? Uh, okay, so then, then you think, but there's no bleeding. There's nothing into the bleed because the only bleeding site was prostate. Okay, the patient is tachycardic, hypertensive, no bleeding, and the catheter is clear. Could be something else going on here. Yeah? Is the patient diabetic? Could be MI, could be something else. Could it be cardiogenic shock, failure, other previous conditions which were missed? So that actually shows how you approach a problem, yeah? Uh, similarly, they can give you a scenario of a difficult patient or a difficult situation. A typical difficult patient is that patient is, uh, uh, you can either have a, a patient who has been postponed <laughs> twice, uh, and it comes in and you've got a certain uh, life-saving emergency call, your consultant have to go. And then you have been asked, okay, you explain to the patient of this pleasant task. Uh, okay, how? Your, your patient is cancelled again. How will you approach that one? And that could be, and they will make sure that the actor, which is sitting there, will give you the, the hardest possible time. Uh, both in terms of uh, being very aggressive, uh, not listening, uh, threatening to, to escalate it, to complain it, uh, to take a legal action, and how you handle the whole situation. Uh, you have to handle it nicely, staying calm, coming out with some sort of plan. So what they're looking at is that how you approach the initial situation, how you tackle during the situation, at the end, did you come up with some sort of plan so the patient can actually have some fallback action? Uh, so it's not uh, leaving uh, the ward without knowing what to do next. So you summarize and you make a plan. You can say that, okay, I'm really sorry and the consultant have to leave. You know, you're important, your operation is very important. Uh, it has to be done by somebody senior. There is no theater available, as you know, the, the NHS setup. There's a limited theater space, no other theater I can do. With very heavy heart, we have to postpone you again. But I can promise you that in the next available situation, we'll give you top priority. I'm going to arrange this thing with the secretary and I'll give you all the contact number, the secretary's number. I myself promise to, to, to speak to the admission department that you have been cancelled previously twice. In the meantime, if you're having this is problem, this is the medication to ease off your symptoms. These are the emergency contact number. And I can reassure you that delaying of your procedure by this one, two, three weeks or so is not going to worsen your situation. Reassuring, medical help, uh, backup contact numbers, communication help, this is how you come across. And when somebody is in real uh, uh, anger or, or losing their temper, the best thing is listen to them, give them time. Uh, obviously, you've got limited time. You can't let them go on uh, for full nine minutes, not doing your own input, but responding to their conversation, listening to them, be open. They say that the communication has got 
three or four major things contents important but 20% only your tone is roughly 30 to 40% and your body language 30 to 40% so come across as a real empathetic or sympathetic uh, generally concerned doctor with open gesture not hiding your face not sitting sideways uh, not crossing your arms uh, not uh, invading the personal space uh keeping uh, your tone soft uh not smiling on the wrong occasion patient is in pain and you're smiling that can give the wrong impression but uh, showing your sympathy nodding your head saying that okay and you make sure that you give all the context number and everything yeah uh you or you can have a very depressed patient you know the patient admitted the surgical outcome wasn't as they were expecting and they are too depressed they have an acute episode of depression thinking of self harming and how do you do that you involve clinical psychologists or psychiatrists do you can you differentiate between one episode of a, a low mood depression versus depressive uh, requiring medication uh, so that that sort of thing yeah you can have ethical dilemma that okay i i mean somebody your colleague has made a mistake trying to cover it up what will you do you know although he is your best friend but uh, what will you do is it going to make pay, uh, a detrimental outcome will you put the data is we involve somebody else will you talk to them coming drunk coming inappropriate having some family issues not uh, able to concentrate on the job not able to uh, to apply properly all these things so these are typical scenarios but as long as you pick them up approach in the right way in the right uh, situation that that's what they're thinking Applied skills again. I think, uh, as I said, that the time is. These are the stations I find that uh, uh, communication skills and applied skills they find their most difficult ones uh, in terms of time wise, because the time passes very quickly. Like uh, in CN drainage, so you tell to the patient, at least verbally consenting, checking their thinking at the same time, asking your assistant that okay, I need this cleaning solution, steroid. or to hexadine or betadine or whatever if no if no uh, allergies to penicillin uh, to iodine yeah or any other contraindication then choosing the right needle right injection you have to tell everybody don't assume anything you have to tell everything okay so do we have a, a syringe a drawing needle an injecting needle of an orange gauge i need 10 mils or 20 mils of 2% i think think loud i think he's around 60 kg 70 kg i'm thinking of my dose this 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 okay i need this milk do you have 1% to 2% what is available they they'll tell you whatever you ask okay in that case my preference is lignocaine is quick acting or i'll take marcaine chirocaine long acting but slow to act uh, and then you say okay i need this blade 50 or 10 i need this instrument artery clip uh, or knife or curet uh, i need the this type of dressing afterwards tell everything so they get everything ready before you start and that tells so many thing a you are organizing you are thinking ahead you are planning you know your stuff and it will go smoothly because the last thing you want the patient starts bleeding you haven't got a gauze oh oh sister can I have a gauze where is the gauze oh god i don't know patient is bleeding time is ticking you are under pressure now you're gone and even real life is even more important with the precaution patient will come with a legal letter So, so yes so all these things are so as long as you practice and stay calm think ahead plan have some sort of system in your head okay i have to communicate i have to order i have to get all the stuff at my hand this is i'm going to execute and i will send him uh, with a summary of all my uh, procedure and post operative instructions at the end say thank you and please please dispose of your stuff yeah okay uh, next one. so typical for example it's, it's like an example of your thinking order or applying your applied anatomy and thing there are three different swellings normally i would have actually made more interactive but uh, say on your left hand the swelling behind the ear lobule stuck to the skin skin is not mobile you can see a small yellowish point most likely swelling arising from a structure from a skin most likely from a gland does it look smooth yeah does look smooth most likely slow growing benign differential diagnosis 
most likely cyst, could be lymph node, could be protein. But most likely cyst, why? It's stuck to the skin, smooth, I can see a point. Second one, similar area, but the skin is mobile. And uh, they clench their jaw and is start is stuck to the to the mandible, not very mobile the deep. Superficial structure layers are mobile, deep is not. Most likely coming from parotid. It's coming from parotid. You have to does it look benign or malignant? Looks like a smooth swelling, not multilobulated, although you can have pleomorphic adenoma. Most likely slow growing, smooth, but I will check the facial nerve function and check for the regional lymph nodes. So that should be higher order thinking. That you're thinking of that, yeah. This swelling, although looks benign, smooth, but still have to check. Maybe you can put your finger inside the mouth to see bimanual palpation. Yeah. Third one, again, a smooth swelling, not stuck to the skin. That could be anything. Could be a lymph node, could be submandibular swelling from coming from the gland. Unlikely from parotid because it's quite away from the actual anatomical boundaries of parotid, yeah. And the parotid swelling is within the parotid fascia, so it's less mobile. If this swelling is more mobile, that is your applied anatomy knowledge. The parotid swellings are within the fascia, which is very immobile. Superficial to that, the swelling will be mobile, like sebaceous cyst. Deep to that, you won't be able to feel, masseter, but it's stuck to the muscle then. And this is, if it's mobile, the submedibular gland is less mobile, it could be lymph node, if you find a lymph node, then your higher order thinking is, is it a primary or a secondary? Most likely secondary, very rare to have a single lymph node primary. So is it coming from an infective or neoplastic process? So I would like to see the inside of the mouth to the draining area that why this patient has developed this swelling. So this is your higher order thinking, okay? Then what next? Okay, if it's a lymph node, you can have the ultrasound and ultrasound guided FNA to rule out or include what sort of, uh, and then you take it further. And these are your questions, yeah? That's what you do in the real life as well. Similarly, swelling in the neck, very common. Midline swelling could be, could be a, a thyroid, but usually not. And how do you differentiate it? Side one is usually diffuse. Is it uh, expanding with your blowing like a thyroid, like a, in the Achilles Jason, like these uh, cysts? This is a rare one, but usually a uh, thyroid gland is much more common. Uh, thyroid swelling moves with swallowing. Why would it move? Because the fascia in which the thyroid gland is enclosed is also attached to your uh, pretracheal fascia uh, and uh, your strap muscles, swallowing muscles. So as you move, the whole fascia moves, the swelling moves. The swelling of thyroglossal cyst can also move with swallowing, but in addition, it will also move with tongue protrusion, which the thyroid will not move because uh, your tongue is attached to the higher bone through a higher glossus uh, ligament, yeah? And if you protrude the tongue alone without swallowing, this swelling should move. Again, you can have a cyst here in this, but the thyroglossal cyst is deep to the skin, so skin is mobile. If the skin is adherent, it could be a sebaceous cyst. So all these, you know, this is your applied knowledge. Ulcer, common thing, you can be shown an ulcer, okay? So, so typically, if there's a trophic ulcer in the pressure point, point, probably patients are not able to feel it. That's how it developed on the pressure point. So is it due to neuropathy, diabetes? So if an ulcer comes, you examine the ulcer, but you have to examine the circulation and sensation. Uh, and uh, vascularity, it could be a venous, but this is not a venous, it's not a gator's area. This is in the pressure point on your left-hand side is the heel, most likely trophic. Is patient mobile or spina bifida or, or spinal injury, something else, as opposed to the other one, which is ulcerated, exophytic, going beyond the surface. Skin irregular, some slough at the base, most likely is uh, some sort of cancer. SCC or something else, yeah? And that is stuck to the base, you have to lymph nodes. But in general, ulcers, again, uh, quickly describe the size, shape, borders, base, fixity. And again, if the, if the shape uh, or the surrounding skin suggests an element of ischemia, 
or neuropathy, then you check for sensation, you check for circulation, and uh, you check for otherwise. And again, if the time permits, you check for the general fitness for the patient and check the regional lymph nodes, all these things, if this also suggests. Okay. Uh, suturing again, uh, learn how you hold the needle holder, how you hold the uh, forceps, uh, even distance from the edges, even distance between the sutures. Uh, usually for a one centimeter area, you'll put two or three stitches, uh, depending on the which part of the body. In the face, you probably put even four because the suture is finer. In the limb, maybe two or three. Uh, tying the knot, practice it. You'll have a weenie, uh, again, there will be station where you are uh, like getting a vessel in the depth. Again, practice it. Weenie puncture, again, choosing your instrument, your fixing uh, tagger pad or whatever, cleaning device, exceeding of the swelling. I've already alluded to that. You will be uh, verbally consenting, approaching the patient, introducing, checking is the right swelling or the more than one. Uh, verbally consenting, getting all the instruments and prayer ready without compromising the, if you have to open up the gloves, okay? So you ask your assistant to open it up or you open it up uh, without touching it and put into sterile tray and open all the sutures and everything put into sterile tray and don't put any unsterile in that tray, any unsterile instrument or anything. Yeah? And then change your gloves and hold the tray in, with the sterile thing. Yeah? So all these things shows that you are actually used to doing with the aseptic non-touch technique. Uh, soft skills are very so I said that you'll be asked to, to consent a patient, to communicate with the consultant over the phone for a situation in which you will not only give the name of the patient, age of the patient, general condition, but also uh, the scenario of the situation, like is it an accident, is it an abscess, is it a, a confused patient, is it unknown pathology, is it a ruptured appendix, whatever, and give your thoughts, what you think is going on, and your plan. And uh, if you're speaking to the patient again, uh, consenting, you should new, new need to know the, the operation. And speaking to colleagues, if you have to involve that, okay, I need uh, urgent histology. This is the frozen section. I'm sending for this. You may be given a situation in which there is a sort of a medical as well as surgical management. For example, somebody on anticoagulation with uh, peritonitis or diverticular disease. So what will you do? or a patient with a liver disease, with the bleeding disorders. So you need to involve the hematologist. Uh, how will you reverse the warfarin in an emergency situation? You can give fresh frozen plasma because the vitamin K will not reverse it. And if you stop it, it will not be effective for two or three days. And patient is the emergency admission. Yeah? So obviously in that situation, you have to have sort of, uh, uh, vitamin K, fresh frozen plasma, everything but you need to know what's the protocol. I'll use the hospital protocol, speak to the hematologist, yeah? Difficult situation, patient have already experienced the aggressive patients, how you approach them, body language, making them comfortable. The situation called spike. You ask them what is uh, the situation, what is the patient perception, uh, what you can do for them, uh, summarize them at the end. So they're different models, as long as you know one of them, yeah? And theater list prioritization, as I said, that you'll be given very difficult sort of scenario, which normally are very rare, but it can happen that uh, a gangrenous digit opposed to strangulated hernia, with a, or opposed to a bleeding uh, wound or a patient going to hypertension or septic uh, peritonitis. It's probably septic would take because the digital gangrene is not a life threatening. You can even, because there's no muscle in there, so there's no chance of having gas gangrene or serious infection. Whereas if the necrotizing fasciitis, that's an emergency, it's a life threatening condition. So you need to know this sort of uh, and prioritize. This is what's for, for example, you'll be shown these set of instruments on the suture skill. So you will choose up, they'll ask you, okay, you choose anything. If it's a face, you choose a fine Edison. Uh, this one, if it's a skin, again, I prefer uh, this one for everything, but you can choose this one. But for the face, it's a bit heavy handed. Never use the non tooth for the skin. This is your suture cutting, or you can choose this one. This is your needle holder. Okay, so you 
you open up your state oil port uh, or container, you, you say, or your assistant, you pick up this, 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 and then you, or you'll be given one set and you choose the blade. Okay, I choose number 11 for Epsil, for example, sorry, 15, 10, whatever. Choose your sutures, choose your blades. Uh, so this is the proline non-absorber. These are the vital suture, this is monocryl. Need to know what sort of packets. So it's usually for the face 5060, uh, for the limbs 30 or 40. Uh, if it's non-absorber, proline is fine, ethylene is fine. Otherwise, if you're putting some deep stitches, monocryl, vital, yeah. And then remember to dispose of your shop because this is a serious mistake if you don't dispose it of. It is your responsibility. Suppose the bell has rung, they ask you, leave it. You can't see in the appendix of this box. You'll tell, I would like to dispose of the shop, so please dispose it of, or at least say it, to verbalize it. Okay, it's not a difficult exam. If you, prepare, you prepare it, you take it logically, you will be fine. Any questions? Uh, you can speak up if there are any questions. You can type in the chat, whatever is suitable for yeah, you. Guys. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You can unmute your speaker or anything. Or... I think that's all. Any question, guys? Uh, you can ask. Can you hear me? Yeah. Hello, it's Dr. Jamal. Um, thank you so much for the opportunity and for the session. It was a really wonderful session. And uh, I would like to thank you all and also encourage to have more of these uh, sessions. I have a question for the sir that uh, recently they have, uh, um, they organized uh, one of uh, the part B here in Pakistan recently in Islamabad. Uh -huh. uh, it's I think the first time or second time that they have done this, uh, the Royal College. So uh, my question is that, uh, is it better to uh, attempt uh, the exam here in Pakistan or if uh, one has a possibility to attempt it in, I don't know, in England or uh, uh, so that one can stay there and have some attachment? What would you suggest? Okay. Uh, to do an exam in England, probably I have a slight, uh, there are pros and cons, okay? Uh, the cons, I will tell you the cons first. The condition which you see here more common will be started rare in Pakistan and vice versa. Okay, So probably mm -hmm. you'll see more leg ulcers, uh, uh, maybe melanoma is more common here. Uh, so there will be some, and there are certain uh, other aspects, for example, how they approach and the hospital setting is slightly <laughs> different. Whereas if you have the opportunity to do it in Pakistan, you'll probably be more familiar with the local things. Uh, and once you've done the exam, you are equally, I mean, you can come here for attachment. That's not a problem. But uh, there is no right and wrong answer if you're familiar. But uh, I think in UK for the clinical side, you will need to do an attachment before exam rather than after mm -hmm. exam. Because I think that you find more useful because the system is very different. And you can easily commit some very simple mistakes because you're not in the system. For example, if the patient controlled analgesia is there on the bedside and you haven't seen it before, oh, what is this thing? Uh, and similarly, there are certain protocols and uh, uh, the, the blood forms are slightly different or the vacuum container or the vacuum container. Uh, it's easily confusing. Uh, so I think, I mean, it's just home ground is always better. There are advantages in my view. Uh, but then once you've done it, the world is open. If you're a good doctor, doesn't matter whether they introduce part D, E, F, whatever, you'll be fine. Exam is exam. If you know your knowledge, if you know how to apply it, doesn't matter whatever format it comes into, you will be fine. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you so much for your time and for the session also. Not at all, not at all. I would like to have your feedback actually on question in this particular session, but yes, uh, I'll leave it for Talha to actually communicate because we want to improve all the time. So. Yes, we will do that, sir. All right. If there is any other questions we would like to answer, otherwise we will be wrapping this up. Uh, uh, hello. Yeah. Uh, can, can you see me? I'm not sure if my camera is visible. 
Yeah. 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 We can hear you, so you can speak up. Yeah. Yeah. Abdul, is it Abdul, is it Abdul, Abdul Hanan? Yeah. Okay. I can say yeah, that. I'm uh, I'm Abdul Hanan. I'm a, a first year resident of plastic surgery in Pakistan. In I'm from Quetta actually, and I have uh, passed lab two and got registration uh, in December 2021. Uh-huh. Uh huh. Uh, uh, like uh, I always wanted to be a plastic surgeon, and uh, so I got into training in Pakistan. But I eventually want to move to UK. So I'm uh, really confused about uh, at this moment that like I, I should try to move at this stage, or uh, like my consultants in Pakistan and my supervisor, they are telling me to uh, to complete my training here in Pakistan, and then I should move later on to the UK. So uh, if you could guide me and uh, I need very, a little bit of counseling. Very quickly, very quickly. If you can afford to come at a junior stage in UK is better because most of you, even if you do my very senior training in Pakistan, you will have to start at a very junior level in UK. So the sooner yeah, actually, the better. Sooner the better. Yeah, actually, I don't mind uh, starting from a very junior level uh, um, because uh, if I train in UK, I get a specialty uh, a completion a specialty training certificate that would be far better for me uh, as expect as I expect. But the thing is that I am trying to uh, uh, I have I have been applying for a lot of posts uh, for uh, junior clinical fellows and FY2 in uh, Department of Plastic Surgery and I'm I'm I don't know what's the you, issue with my you are, you are I'm not unlucky. getting shortlisted. Yeah. You are unlikely to get your first post in plastic surgery. Apply any surgical specialty, get it to UK, and then mm-hmm. get some sort of experience here because at the junior level, you need the system experience first. Yeah. So, any specialty, whatever, even attachment, get into the system first. You'll be very lucky to get into plastic surgery because very, very competitive, very competitive. But there are ways around it. You come to the UK, apply into any surgical specialty, have some training, and then within that hospital, try to join the have some experience in plastic and gradually go into the junior post. But the more you delay, the more it will be difficult. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Anything else? I think we would be wrapping this up. And thank you so much, sir. It was a brilliant session. It was. Uh, I really enjoyed it. It was simple and it, it and at the same moment it was thorough. So thank you so much and. Special thanks to you for today because it's a bank holiday. My pleasure. <laughs> my pleasure. Thank you. Always my pleasure. Thank you. 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 Th